Hi, Sally. Hi, it's Graham here. Hi, Graham. Um, I'm just going to um, try and share your slides uh, as a practice run. It's not going to go to all the others on the screen, is it? Uh, yes, it will. Huh? At, 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 we'll just try the first slide. Okay. As a practice. Good. You seeing that? I am. Then I think everything's fine. Good. Yeah. I'm going to stop sharing for now. Okay. Hi, Sony. How are you doing? Hi, Tobacco. I'm fine, thank you. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Thank you for asking. I trust you well. I can't hear you very well. Is your sound good? My sound is good. Is it better now? A little bit. Wonderful. I um, will just make uh, a few announcements before you start your lecture. That's fine. Wonderful. I'm very much looking forward to it. Well, it's not so much a lecture as an interactive discussion, I hope. So, um, yeah. Absolutely. Brilliant. Hmm. Okay. So, so when, when we start out in Tobacco, I'll just hand immediately over to you uh, to different. make some Thanks initial so uh, comments. Yeah. Okay, Sally, I'm I'm just going to go on on uh, mute and uh, and and uh, off video. Do I do the about same? Three minutes too, and then and then I'll come back on. Do I do the same? Yeah, you can do. Yeah. So it's like a gas drink.
can't remember what it used to, but it seems to be on the computer. Shall we get started, Grant? Yes, let, let's go and get uh, going. So, welcome to um, this afternoon's uh, Department of Medicine okay. meeting. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, Professor Ntuzi to make uh, an, an opening announcement before we get going with the main theme of uh, this afternoon's discussion. Thank you very much, Graham. Good afternoon, colleagues. I wanted um, to make uh, three important announcements. The first one um, is really an acknowledgement that this is our first departmental meeting since the passing of Emeritus Professor Stuart Saunders. And I thought it was important to acknowledge um, his work and contributions as well as uh, passing. Um, um, Thanks, Greg. So Professor Saunders was the fourth chair and head of medicine um, at the University of Cape Town and Kodaskia Hospital, uh, having led uh, this department from 1971 to 1980. He is remembered by many as a wonderful teacher, a meticulous clinician with an impeccable bedside manner. He's also remembered by many of you as a fearless leader 
who amongst uh, many other accomplishments ended racially segregated training of medical registrars in this department and hospital. Following his tenure as uh, head of department, he was appointed as vice chancellor of the university uh, from 1981 to 1996, during a period of great political turmoil and great social change in this country, a role he played with distinction. A memorial service is planned by the university for next week, Wednesday, the 24th at 7 p.m. And the link for that meeting will be circulated. I'd like to ask you if you can join me in a moment of silence to honor the life and memory of Professor Saunders. Thank you. The second uh, announcement. Thank you, Grant. The second announcement I wish to make um, is to inform you that um, today will be Dr. Lorraine Boyan's uh, last uh, Department of Medicine uh, meeting, as she will be leaving uh, Khodeskia Hospital uh, at the end uh, of February. Uh, Lorraine uh, joined um, as a medical manager for medical services for medicine um, a couple of years back. And by dint of personal industry, her charm and an enviable work ethic, she has contributed significantly to transformation of our department. And she lives it undoubtedly much better. She is highly regarded by many of you as a fantastic medical manager. On a personal note, I'm grateful to Lorraine for the wonderful friendship and camaraderie we have cultivated over the years. It's been an honor for me to serve alongside him. And Lorraine, I wish you all the best with your future endeavors. I hope that you will always know that our department will always be your home. Finally, I wish um, to make an announcement uh, in relation uh, to the process for rollout of vaccines for healthcare workers, as there's been a lot of confusion uh, in the last couple of days and lots of queries uh, elevated to my office. So all of you by now um, as healthcare workers should have received the link to register on the electronic vaccination data system or EBDS as it's known. And uh, once you register on uh, EBDS, you should receive a text acknowledging your registration. You will then um, get a link uh, for the site for Sesonge vaccine program, which is hosted by the South African Medical Research Council. And you need to read uh, the study information leaflet and then complete an electronic uh, consent form. After that, you will receive a second text um, with a unique voucher number, which is needed uh, for when you get vaccinated. All of you will be contacted uh, by the hospital uh, and people from within our department um, and the management with a date, time, and venue for your vaccination. It's important uh, that when you go for your appointment, you bring either your South African ID book or your passport, as well as your voucher number. Otherwise, you will not be vaccinated uh, as I learned today. It's also important uh, to emphasize that um, only 1,500 uh, doses have been allocated to Khodeskia Hospital for this first trench. Um, and we're planning um, that the vaccination of healthcare workers will continue for the next uh, 12 weeks. 
and we've taken uh, an approach to prioritization of healthcare workers, which looks at age, uh, comorbidities, uh, exposure and area of work, uh, which determine your risk. And we go from colleagues with the highest risk to those with the lowest risk. And so we will uh, make sure that nobody uh, is left behind and that all healthcare workers uh, do eventually get vaccinated. But it is likely that um, uh, not everybody will be vaccinated um, as part of this first tranche. So if you are not, do not be alarmed. We will be issuing out more communication uh, in the coming uh, days and weeks uh, to keep you updated. Graham, thank you very much uh, for this time. I hand over to you. Right. Thank you, Tobacco. So it's a great uh, pleasure and, and privilege um, to welcome our speaker today, who is uh, Professor Sally Benita. Uh, professor Benita is, is an emeritus professor in our department and was the founding director of UCT's Bioethics Center. He was a professor of medicine at UCT from 1980 to 2007 and chair of our department and chief physician at Khrushchev from 1980 to 1999. He was a visiting professor of medical ethics at University College London Medical School in the late 1990s, annually invited visiting professor of public health sciences and medicine at University of Toronto from 2000 to, to 2018, and was chair of the interim National Health Research Ethics Committee in South Africa and past president of the International Association of Bioethics from 2001 to 2003. Professor Benita has remained very close to our department since his retirement, showing a very keen interest in the developments within the department and of individuals within the department, offering counsel and support and motivating words to us as a department over the years. And he remains actively involved in our academic program. Today's discussion or today's talk will be more the format of an interactive discussion rather than a lecture and is titled Professionalism, Plagues and Public Health Ethics. The shockwaves that we've experienced as a result of COVID-19 over the last year in our society, our health system, and as a medical profession are, are known well to all of us. And today, the, the intention of this interactive discussion is to reflect on issues around professionalism and public health ethics uh, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and its impacts. So to start off with, I'm firstly gonna share um, Professor Benita's screen. And then ask Professor Benita if he will make uh, a few comments, uh, introductory comments to set the scene uh, for this afternoon's discussion. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you, although I would be, I would prefer, can we get that one off, Graham? Can we take yeah. that? Yeah, sure. okay. I'm very pleased to be with you, although I'd much prefer to be there physically rather than virtually. But what I want to begin to say before I start is to echo some of the thoughts about uh, Professor Stuart Saunders. I first met Stuart Saunders on the 1st of January, 1966, uh, the first day that I practiced medicine as an intern in Ward D1 at Kuliskia Hospital. And I've known him continuously since then in a wide variety of, of, of uh, relationships. And uh, I will have more to say about that on, on another occasion, but I want to echo uh, two things about him. First of all, that I know that he would be enormously proud of the way the Department of Medicine has handled the COVID uh, pandemic. And he would be delighted too. And I know he, is, he was delighted before he died in the leadership the department continues to, to have um, in the two professors of medicine that are with you today. And I'm sure he would like me to, to, to say that. The next point I want to make is I just want to read you a quote that was um, spoken many years ago and ask you perhaps in the chat box for you to tell me who said it and when. So let me read that to you. It says, humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. And of these, by far the greatest, by far the most terrible, is fever. Does anybody know who said that and when? Um, 
Graham, if you get some quick answers, you might want to read those. Otherwise, we can leave that till later, and I could tell you later who's it. Okay, Sally, I'll, I'll look. Um, I've got two answers so far. Yes. And the two answers uh, are William Osler. That is correct. And the, 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 and he said that uh, 125 years ago in 1896. Good, thank you. Okay, so let me go on to, to the next slide where I want to just briefly indicate the kind of background and the context to the issues that we're dealing with today. You all know that infectious diseases have been with us since ancient times and that we handle these uh, periodically. And they've been recrudescing recently with many, many impacts on our lives, although none as severe as the COVID epidemic. But the COVID pandemic has emerged and spread within what many of us are calling an increasingly unstable world in which a pervasively adverse global political economy has tipped the world into a state of entropy, which is characterized by emerging infectious diseases and environmental threats of enormous magnitude. That is the context in which this uh, pandemic has emerged. So there really are two pandemics on the go, the pandemic of environmental challenges and the pandemic of infectious diseases. Now, the other point I want to make is that uh, the failure to see health as deeply social linked in many ways to the ways in which we live and how, how our lives are supported. Uh, has undermined the enterprise of medicine and has undermined the peace and stability of, of nations and, and the world. Uh, we haven't really realized that until now. And the immense challenge that comes up with the COVID pandemic is to see medicine as a universally caring social and humanitarian institution within nations and globally that requires extensive rethinking and reimagining of the skills and goals of medicine and their promotion within what hopefully would be sustainable societies. I think it's important to realize that background. We, we somehow uh, drift through the world thinking that uh, progress is going to take place in much the same way as it took place in the past. And I've had the pleasure of growing through an enormously productive and progressive uh, world since I graduated, but things are changing radically. And the way we need to look at ourselves and look at the world uh, is, is extraordinarily challenging, and I'll come back to that at the end of the presentation. Next slide, or a question. Oh yes, so this slide shows you, uh, not a very good slide, it's a bit uh, blurred, shows you the plagues that have taken place uh, over time, uh, starting with the Black Death, and you'll see the size of the number of people that died during that plague, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you get down to COVID and down near the bottom and Ebola. So what we're facing in terms of numbers of deaths at the moment remains relatively small compared to previous plagues, but nevertheless a major problem for the reasons that I've indicated earlier. So I just wanted to show you that, to show you how long plagues have been with us and will continue to be with us, um, for reasons that relate to the structure and the nature of the world. Thanks, Sully. So the first uh, set of questions that I want to ask was really kind of to deal with some of the foundational concepts uh, within your, your title for today's talk. And, and firstly to ask, what does it mean to be a professional? Okay. Well, I think the things I've listed on this slide that come from classical descriptions of professionals like doctors and lawyers and accountants and other people is probably well known to you. Uh, the idea that uh, professionals have specialized knowledge and skills, they have in-depth training in complex fields of great social value, and that, that is an important fact, and that they consider to be dedicated to their work and committed to the welfare of their clients, so it's called, but of course we would prefer to call our, our patients, not clients. And that we have the privilege of making decisions under conditions of uncertainty and are trusted to do so. And the profession is supposed to be self-governing, although there are very many reasons to believe that that is not the case. But the essence of what it means to be a professional, in my view, is someone who wants to be excellent at what he does, he or she does, who strives to do everything in an excellent manner, who never believes they've done it well enough, and whose ideal is to do as well as they can and improve that for the 
duration of their life. Um, I, I, I like to think of professionalism as dedication to the virtue of excellence, that excellence under, underlies uh, what we want to do. So what are the attributes of professionals that, uh, that enable us to do that? Well, the first, and I think it's central, is the idea of integrity, to be a whole person, to be a complete person, to be a complete physician, to lead one's life as well as one leads one's role as a, as a physician or a, health, or a healthcare worker. Trustworthiness is central to professionalism. If we are not trusted, and sadly, we live in a world in which science and medicine have long been untrusted for various reasons, not least due to the way that we ourselves as a profession, not necessarily individually, uh, have, been, have, have behaved. We should have humility and compassion. The idea that uh, physicians can be arrogant and, and lack an understanding of what it means to be suffering is not compatible with the attributes of, of a physician. Our predominant concern should be caring for others. And we should be capable of making prudent and wise decisions, not necessarily on our own, but together with colleagues and in consultation with increasingly large teams of people. Professions at large are admired and respected for an ethic of service because of the way they use their skills and in a morally acceptable way uh, for society and in the light of professional standards. Now I want to suggest to you that the way the best physicians practice forms the authority and the legitimacy of their, of their role in healthcare. The, the worse doctors or the, 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 the less doctors meet these professional attributes in practice, the more the value of the profession in, in society's eyes. I think these are important. There's some basic and enduring medical skills that form what we do as practitioners, and these are well known to you. We have to know all about the human body. We have to know how to work. We need to be able to make a diagnosis and a clinical diagnosis at the bedside, which means the ability to communicate, to elicit information from the patient, uh, to do so in a way that enables us to get a complete picture of what the problem is. When it moves on to uh, using investigations, we need to use these in a purposeful and responsible manner, not just in a blunderbuss manner. The way we use our investigations has to be carefully thought through, in particular under circumstances of uh, resource constraints. We need to be able to evaluate the extent and the impact of the disease on the patient's life trajectory. That means that at the time we see the patient, we should be trying to make an assessment of where along the path of the natural history of the disease has this patient progressed to. That also helps us to develop a prognosis of what might happen if nothing were done and also about what interference medically could do to alter that trajectory. There are many, many uncertainties in medicine, as you know, and much has been written about the uncertainty of the way in which we need to practice. But we need prudence and wisdom, given those uncertainties, when we plan appropriate treatment interventions and work in an iterative manner so that we keep coming back to what we thought we knew and what we hoped to do and to, and to reevaluate our, our, our actions. We also need to have sufficient detachment to apply knowledge in an unbiased manner. So why we need to be compassionate and empathetic and, 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 and attached to the patient in some ways, we do have to be unbiased and detached to the extent that we can apply the knowledge appropriately. And then as I've mentioned earlier, we need humility and insight into the limitations of knowledge and medicine. Increasingly, we have to work in teams uh, that has never applied more than it applied in the COVID pandemic. And you know more about that than me, and I'm sure could teach me a lot about it uh, if you were to, to, to interact with me uh, personally. There are also some humanistic attributes associated with good medicine. It's not only those scientific and clinical attributes, which are the first base, which we hope we can impart to all students uh, during their early years of training. The humanistic attributes are much more difficult to apply and to teach because they, they learned over time. Uh, the first thing is to understand suffering in specific contexts. What it means to suffer in one place or another can vary enormously. 
And I would venture to suggest that for those of us or those of you who've never suffered and who've never been a patient, it may be difficult to comprehend what suffering actually means. Somehow we need to be able to inspire confidence, trust and hope without being deceitful. Our desire to tell the truth or our desire to protect patients from the truth should never lead us into being deceitful. So we have to establish trusting relationships and that needs to be done across multiple communication barriers, cultural barriers, linguistic barriers, social barriers, uh, status barriers. It's, it's very, very complex to establish that kind of meaningful communication, yet that is an essential aspect of what it means to practice good medicine. And more and more we've come to understand that involving patients in decision-making is important. It is not possible for us to merely uh, proclaim what needs to be done without involving patients in decision-making as difficult as that may be. Caring with concern and compassion is well known, but what about the sense of solidarity? Do we understand what solidarity means? I mean, I just look at the moment at the concept of solidarity at a global level, and I see how the vaccines are being uh, soaked up by some countries in vast quantities, how there's little mention in much of the literature that one reads uh, from the global north about solidarity with healthcare workers in the global south. The idea of solidarity must begin at the level of interpersonal relationships, but it should extend much more uh, broadly. There also needs to be a sensitivity to ethical dilemmas with empathy regarding the stresses of the lives of our patients that are frequently very, very different from our own. The idea that we can imagine what other people's lives are like from our own perspective and, uh, and, and therefore be able to deal with them entirely from our perspective uh, is deluded. We need to work out and understand the uniqueness and the individuality of each person and to appreciate the, the value of each person's life and its finitude. So those are the humanistic attributes which are associated with good medicine and which I'm sure all of you know already. I don't think I'm teaching you or telling you anything uh, that you haven't heard. So Sally, the, the next question that I wanted to come to was, you know, you've discussed these values that underpin uh, the medical profession. How are they challenged uh, in our contemporary society? And I'm really talking about the pre-COVID era. Um, in what ways does, does contemporary society challenge these pr professional values? Thank you, Graham, for asking that question. And this is a question that has been uh, addressed extensively in the medical literature by people from a range of different disciplines. What I'm going to be showing you is some information from a medical sociologist called Elliot Friedson, who over a period of about 30 or 40 years, so wrote, wrote, wrote several uh, books about professionalism and what it meant and what the threats to professionalism were. He said that there were three logics, if you like, or three languages or three ideologies that governed the world and determined how we behaved. Uh, the first was, uh, the first was not the first, but the most important because it's so powerful is, is the logic of the marketplace. Uh, the logic of rational choices, uh, competition and consumerism uh, derived largely from the field of economics and based in the idea of freedom of choice and, and freedom of patients to make their own decisions. That language from the arrow that you'll see in the circle has been on the rise increasingly since about 1980. The next language and logic is the language and logic of the law and of bureaucracy, which aims at controlling the way professions practice and, and, and the way we live. Uh, the idea here is that there should be standardization, there should be formal planning, there should be efficiency in what we do, all of which are important and necessary and which we cannot do without. But the rise of bureaucracy has also in many ways uh, stifled uh, the, the actions of, 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 our, of our profession and of many other professions. So with the rise of the market language and the rise of the bureaucratic language, the third logic, which is the logic of professionalism, next, based in the ethics of professionalism, has with the black arrow showing going down, been squeezed out a little by the other two logics. Our own logic of professionalism is based on knowledge, based on dedication, based on self-regulation, and is underpinned by trust. So we're living in a world where none of those languages play out completely or normally or fully in the way they were originally described. 
but all of them impinge on our professionalism and we need to be aware of that to know that these are enormous challenges that prevent us necessarily from doing precisely what we think and know is good as a profession. Next slide. So how do we balance the tension between these values? Because that's the trick. The trick is not to think we can go from the one extreme to the other or get rid of some of those pressures, but how do we balance them? Next. On the one hand, we have the idea of, of, of professionalism as a calling. People who feel that they've been called to this profession and that goes back a long time to many people who from their religious background uh, took on the idea of, of, of practicing medicine. In, in that conception of medicine, the idea of virtue, and I mentioned earlier the idea of virtue as excellence, but being a virtuous and good human being and being a good doctor has underpinned that idea of the calling of professionalism. And the commitments here are to individuals, uh, of course, to the public good as well, uh, usually with a degree of altruism and uh, aiming ultimately at being excellent in what one does. The contesting value comes from the idea of um, medicine or a profession as a career associated with entrepreneurship. Uh, here, the underlying idea is the, the free market industry where the struggle is for power, position and privilege. And this contest between these two polar views of, of medicine and the professions has been with us forever. Hippocrates commented on them. Many people over the ages have commented on these and asked how, how can we find the middle ground between them? Because they're not just polar extremes, they are overlapping spectra. And there are components of them in all our lives that we need to find some kind of middle ground. And my suggestion is that the way we seek to find our way through that maze is through the next point, through the idea of professional ethics, examining those issues and trying to find ways in which we can best behave without conflicts of interest, uh, without being uh, unduly uh, self-interested, uh, with the degree of altruism and concern for individuals and the public good that's required of us. And that's why debates on ethical issues are so important. They don't necessarily give us all the answers, but they enable us to examine these issues, to dissect them out, and to try to find out what the best thing is to do and why. Unfortunately, many people think of ethics as rules and codes of conduct, and all you have to do is look at those rules and try to interpret them, but it's much more complex than that, because like all complex issues, uh, there's a degree of reasoning that's required. One needs to examine the arguments and evaluate them and try to make decisions that are wise and that people can recognize as being the most appropriate. So that's the plug for the idea of professional ethics, which unfortunately is underplayed everywhere, not adequately supported, not necessarily taught with people with appropriate training, uh, without the resources by universities or medical schools uh, to support those endeavors. Uh, many of them are related largely to research ethics where there's a commercial value to the work being done. Uh, the professional value and the humanistic values of ethics are not valued to the extent that they should be. And hence the ability to teach and promote those issues uh, in a scholarly manner is, is significantly reduced. Thanks, Sally. So I wanted to move on to the next issue, which is the, the term public health ethics. And what that means uh, in distinction to medical ethics, what is, what is the difference of those two terms? Thanks, Graham. That's also a very good question. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we first need to ask the question, what is public health? Uh, as you all know, again, concern with the health of whole populations. There is a contract that we as healthcare professionals have with society as a whole. Our contract is not just with individual patients, it's also with society. And that contract and the idea of public health ethics gives the state the right to override individuals' right to privacy when this would help protect public health. And so to give an example, if I present to your clinic and you find that I have tuberculosis, uh, you notify me to the Department of Public Health because uh, tuberculosis is a notifiable disease. I don't have the right to keep that private to myself but I do have the right of confidentiality and privacy, which means that my name won't be put in the newspaper that I've got tuberculosis, but it will be used by public health authorities to trace contacts and to ensure that I receive appropriate treatment. So the state does have the right to override individuals' right to privacy, but that right must be legitimated by policies and laws of government uh, that are appropriate. 
So the next slide shows um, some of the uh, principles of public health ethics, uh, which, are, which I, I just want to, sorry, apologies. I want to show how the discourse was expanded. I referred initially to interpersonal ethics, which is the kind of ethics we practice conventionally in medical ethics. Um, it's based on respect for individual choices. It's known, take that one off. Um, it, it, it lies behind the whole rise of autonomy that took place in the 1970s and 1980s. And that in many ways has been associated with patients having much more of a say in what they do in relationship to their illness. And the basic uh, principle there is the idea of freedom, freedom of patients to be respected uh, of equal moral worth and to participate in the decision making uh, around their care. When the SARS epidemic arose in Toronto, and I was there at the time, the whole question of public health ethics arose. Next slide. Next point. And public health ethics uh, rose around the common good, the idea of institutional justice, which meant how do hospitals operate? How do they allocate their resources? How do they make their policies? Um, how is quarantine implemented? And how can we do that all with respect, not so much for freedom, but for equity? treating people equally in many ways, in as many ways as we can. And this, of course, raised the challenge of next, the idea of balancing individual rights with collective rights and responsibilities. And it was very interesting in Toronto at the time, a very rights oriented community, that the community very easily and quite comfortably uh, got used to the idea of quarantine being imposed for their benefit. And it was not incompatible with their rights to be confined to their homes and be prevented from seeing their dear ones in hospitals because they understood that individual rights are intimately linked uh, to the common good. It's not possible to have individual rights without ideas of responsibility that are linked uh, to the common good. Well, with time and not least with the global economic crisis in 2008 and also with the COVID epidemic, the, the discourse on, on ethics and human rights had to shift to the idea of global health ethics and planetary health ethics, where the idea of uh, the ethics of international relationships, the ethics of how health is governed at the World Health Organization, how health is governed in countries, how uh, the, the food trade, how the weapons trade, how international development aid is given, how debt is accumulated and preserved, the ethics lying behind all of those issues became crucial to better understanding the disparities in health at the global level and what needed to be done. And again, the idea that uh, lay behind this was now solidarity, the idea that we were all interconnected, that we were connected through the environment and that we had environmental rights, if you like, the right to a, a, an environment which would not damage and harm our health. And what this meant next was that um, we had to add global health responsibilities to our responsibilities to patients and responsibilities uh, to um, our own communities. Now, this language hasn't really caught on. The idea that we are interconnected at a global and planetary level has, has not been popularized. I think that for the first time, certainly people in the global north are beginning to realize this with, with the COVID epidemic. Uh, yet these were ideas that we had promulgated uh, in Toronto in the, in the early uh, 2000s. And I think that that language is going to become much more uh, prominent. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are the principles of public health ethics? If we're going to over override the rights of individuals, and if we're going to allow the state to impose conditions that, that uh, prevent those rights from being met, there are several principles that need to be met. The first is the harm principle which means that there's only justification for restricting the liberty of people to prevent harm to others. The effect of this principle means that whatever you're doing must be effective. The necessity principle means that there should be no other method that conflicts less with other moral considerations. And the proportionality principle requires a positive balance between the benefits of imposing that restriction and the adverse effects. And finally, there's the least restrictive means principle, which means uh, the least coercive means must be used to impose the imposition of, of, of restricting people's individual rights. Thanks, Sally. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now um, because I want to move on to a few additional questions that, that really deal with some of these issues that you've discussed, but in the context of COVID-19. 
And the first question I want to ask is, in, in your view, in what ways do you think the medical prof profession as a profession has risen to the challenge of, of dealing with this, this epidemic and this, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, and what ways do you think we've fallen short and could have th done things differently? Well, I think with regard to how well we've done, in my view, sitting in this uh, small study of mine where I've been locked down for most of the year, uh, but communicating with the rest of the world and seeing what's going on, I think the profession has done remarkably well. I think we've done amazingly well. You guys have all done amazingly well at Chris Care Hospital. I think the hospitals in the Western Cape and the healthcare professionals in the Western Cape, and to the extent that it's been possible given the deprived condition elsewhere in the country, people have put their backs to the wall and they've tried remarkably hard. Um, I, I, I think that one can only be proud of the extent to which health professionals in our country and elsewhere have attempted to live up to the very high expectations of them and to deal with something that really is a curved ball that's knocked their lives out of total balance, created a, a world which is unknown to us and strange to us, and yet they've uh, managed to do the fantastic work they, they do and continue to do, and on which I compliment you all. With regard to how we've fallen short and how things could have done differently, I think that there's an enormous amount of analysis and introspection and reflection needed to know that. And I can't provide that for you. I think those are the kinds of things that we need to go to sit back and, and look at. And again, I come back to the SARS epidemic in Toronto. When that was over, there was a one-day symposium, a sort of a post-mortem, where all the people who had participated in caring for patients during that pandemic came together to talk about their emotions and their actions and where they felt they'd succeeded and where they felt they'd failed and what needed to be done in the future if there was another pandemic. So I can't really answer that except to say that as happy as we should be with what we've done and we have done very well, the time for reflection and analysis and, and self-criticism lies ahead of us. Thanks. So then another question, um, leading on from that, you, you know, there's been an enormous burden placed on, on medical professionals as a, as a collective and as individuals in this time. And I'm sure, you know, everyone on this call can relate to that issue. Uh, you know, many, of, many people have gone, you know, well above and beyond uh, what would be expected of them uh, in a usual situation outside of the pandem pandemic situation with often negative personal and, and mental health con consequences for some of us. And, and that begs the question as, as to what are the limits that uh, professionals can, can set in terms of what's expected of them in such a, a, such a situation. Uh, you know, you've outlined what the aspirations are, what the, the principles underlying our, our medical professional behavior are, but are there limits uh, that, that, that apply in a situation like this? Yes, I think so, Graham. I think that the idea that everybody can be a, a perfect hero and uh, sacrifice themselves ultimately to whatever their calling is, is unrealistic. Uh, there, there are a whole range of kinds of people in the world. Some are heroic in some ways, others are heroic in other ways. Not everybody can be heroic in precisely the same way. Uh, when 9-11 took place, there were hundreds of, of firefighters who died in the building. Uh, they were deemed heroes, but there could have been many other heroes who didn't die in the building. So I don't think we can set heroism or set some extraordinary high level as the norm. I think what we should be asking of people is to do the best they can, knowing themselves, knowing their strengths, knowing their limitations, and knowing what the ideals are. And while striving through those ideals, doing the best they can. And those are the, things, the expectations we should have. And we should not be surprised if some people rise higher than others, other people don't quite make it. We need to be supportive of each other in a community. It's not as though we can judge people on a single scale. And if you don't reach the top end of that scale, you failed. Um, I think the need for collaboration rather than competition, uh, this, is not, this is not sport where you're looking who could be the, the biggest hero and, and break the barrier first before anywhere else. It's a collaborative endeavor that we need to be enormously supportive of each other uh, in, in carrying it through. And I think, Sally, that's something, you know, when COVID hopefully is one day but behind us, you know, picking up the pieces and being supportive, you know, moving forward and kind of 
reconstituting ourselves as, as a community in, in the wake of COVID is going to really be important as well. Um, and um, in terms of just, um, you know, COVID-19 has, has clearly been the defining uh, global plague of, of our century. And, you know, you, you mentioned the previous plagues in one of your introductory slides. What, what do you think stands out about this plague that is so different to previous plagues? Well, I think the very first point is the context in which it's arisen. It's arisen, as I've indicated earlier, in a very complex world, which is unstable from many perspectives, unstable economically, unstable ecologically, unstable biologically, unstable ecologically, unstable from many, many points of view. This is a unique time that this plague is arising in. And it's arising at a time where multiple tipping points towards other dangers are rapidly occurring in the world. The, the, the impact of the climate change, uh, the, 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 the power shutdowns with the major snowfalls in America, for example, the, the mass migration of people who are leaving horrendous circumstances, seeking a better life elsewhere. These sorts of complications put uh, this, this epidemic into a remarkable context. It's also in a world in which, as I've indicated earlier, the marketplace and money as the bottom line dominate. And that domination has no ethical underpinnings at all. It's based on ideas relating to freedom of the market, which have been shown to be fraudulent and erroneous. And the idea that what we're doing and the way we live our lives is, is supported by ethical considerations is, in my view, far from true. And the worst thing about it is that we don't have time. It's not as though we have time to continue to make mistakes. We can't make mistakes and hope that we're going to recover from those mistakes. Gone are the days of competing with each other. We have to collaborate with each other. We have to understand each other across vastly different chasms of culture, status, uh, economic levels, uh, skills, unless we can move into a cooperative kind of world where people recognize that we're all in this together, not only within our country, but within the world. Unless we can see that the future of humankind is critically dependent on a new paradigm of thinking, a paradigm of thinking that will teach us to live with nature and not to consume nature and to consume everything in our quest for more of everything. Uh, that, is, that is the context in which, um, in, in, in which we have to deal with this, uh, with this plague. So uh, I think that um, it, it is unique. It's unique because of the context and, and we need to appreciate that. So Lee, I, I just wanted to say to the audience that I've got one more question and, and if people have uh, questions then to either type them in the, the chat function or to raise their hands. My, my last question is, is what do you think are the most critical, critical uh, public health dilemmas uh, that have been brought forward by COVID-19 and how is COVID-19 going to change global thinking in the field of, of public health and public health ethics uh, going forward? Okay, well, the first thing is that, you know, medicine has been characterized for many, many years for totally neglecting the social determinants of health. We somehow think that health is all about biomedicine. If somebody gets sick and they come to a hospital or a clinic and we prescribe something and we help them to get better, and that's the end of the story. But why people get sick, how they get sick, how they cope with their illness, what predisposes them to be ill, what results in some people have a life expectancy of 50 years while other people have a life expectancy of 80 years, those are deeply social issues. And the COVID epidemic is deeply social and we tended to neglect that. And we've neglected that because we've neglected the structural problems, the structural problems that underlie the way the world works. And so what we have is healthcare systems which I won't describe in detail to you, but there are, in my view, all healthcare, if every, all healthcare systems everywhere are distorted, they're dysfunctional, and they're unsustainable for various reasons and in various combinations in different countries in the world. And I and others have, have written about this. And we haven't thought deeply enough about what health really is and what healthcare is about. Finally, we've lacked a thoughtful allocation of resources. For many years, we've known that the demand will always exceed the supply. And there are methods of trying to make resource allocation of decisions, not just for emergency issues, but for how we practice medicine and how we try to deliver better healthcare. And we've totally neglected that. They are difficult to do, but then so, so much else that we do in medicine. 
And as a result of all of this, one of the major public health issues that we're facing is the burnout of health professionals. The demands, as you've indicated, are so enormous that some people are burning out. And um, the interesting thing about this is that in the USA, how do they approach burnout? Many physicians are burning out in the USA. They, they're approaching it by trying to educate physicians to cope with burnout, to be more resilient. That's not the answer. The answer is to look upstream and to ask why they're burning out and to try to correct the factors that are causing people to burn out. And so we fail to do that. And that's another challenge for the future. Thanks, Salisa. I do want to see if there are any questions uh, from anyone in the audience. I see one hand. Uh, Linda Baloko. Yes. Did you want to uh, ask thanks. Thanks, Prof. Uh, Benita, for a wonderful talk this afternoon. I just want your opinion on uh, a couple of issues in terms of uh, social inequities and injustices of, into how has COVID-19 exacerbated those inequities that we realize in the world and in South Africa and those injustices that we see right across South Africa and the world. How, has they, how have they been exacerbated by COVID-19? Yeah, they've been exacerbated by COVID-19 because of the structure of the world uh, and the structural violence that's built into the world. And I want to read you a quote uh, from uh, Johan Galtung, who is a Norwegian sociologist and the principal founder of a discipline of peace and conflict studies. Um, and he said as follows, and this was in around about 1980, there is a crisis in the world today now even felt by those of us who enjoy the power and privilege at the top of the world. There's a crisis of violence. There's a crisis of misery and a threat of poverty. There's a crisis of repression and a threat of repression of all human rights. There's a crisis in the environment. And here is the crunch. At the root of the crisis is not resource scarcity or price increases or population pressures, but the world structure. And I've mentioned that already, the way the world is structured, the way it works, the structural violence that's built in uh, to so many aspects of life, the structural violence of racism, the structural violence of, of poverty, the, the, the structural violence that is unleashed when an epidemic like COVID uh, takes place. Those are the fault lines that have been revealed. And all of a sudden, although these things have been written about for many, many decades, we're suddenly beginning to realize that this is the problem. Thanks, and thanks, Linda, for that question. Um, Zenaid, I, I see you've got a question. Yeah, uh, thanks, Graham, um, and thanks, Prof, for that talk. Uh, nice to see you again, even if it's only virtually. Um, my question is, how do we manage the sometimes unrealistic expectations society has of medicine and medical professionals? I mean, for example, in another we finally getting the, the vaccine against COVID-19, and many people expect that they not only will get it immediately, but that it will work equally well for everybody and somehow completely prevent them from getting infected by COVID. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it doesn't, we know it doesn't work like that, but how, you know, how do we get that, how do we manage that, that expectation? Uh, Junaid, nice to hear your voice and to not see you necessarily, but to hear you. Uh, yes, it's a complicated question. I think that what we need to do is we need to try to, 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 to manage these expectations honestly and, and with humility. We, we can't meet them all. We have to admit what we can do and what we can't do. And we should try to do what we haven't done well better if we can. And again, through a collaborative endeavor, rather than through beating each other on the head, there's an enormous need for collaboration and communication and being in it together and I think that uh, some of the things I'll say in my final comments relate to the expectations that we have of ourselves and of medicine and what the public have, which, which need to be rethought. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks. Okay. thanks so, Tobacco, you have your, your hand up. Thanks, Graham. Um, I, I really have uh, three comments uh, to make. Uh, the first one is to Thank you, Soli, for a superb lecture. I really, really enjoyed that. I thought um, the comments you made um, were very timely. 
uh, and uh, found um, great uh, resonance, I'm sure, not only for me, but for many others uh, attending the lecture today. Um, the second comment I, I wish to make, sorry, is that um, I think that in recognizing uh, the many successes we have had um, as healthcare workers uh, in this hospital, um, we need uh, not to be too self-righteous because uh, one of the things um, that have been abundantly, um, flagrantly displayed uh, by COVID-19 uh, are the inequities in society. Uh, and I think we've been uh, fortunate to have um, a large group of very dedicated uh, staff members uh, who through their loyalty and uh, commitment to the work of this department uh, really enabled a lot of the successes. And um, when I uh, visited the Eastern Cape towards the end of last year, it was uh, brought to me how clear the inequalities uh, in terms of human resources and other resources can bear on health outcomes, uh, even uh, where staff uh, and healthcare workers are incredibly committed. Uh, and the last uh, comment I wish to make, uh, Soli, is that the wonderful tributes uh, you have uh, reminded us of, uh, ones that I think uh, not only healthcare workers, but as Valerie uh, has reminded us, all professionals uh, should aspire to. Uh, and I would argue that um, in this past year, uh, many of us as healthcare workers have fallen short uh, of these uh, attributes. And what has occupied my mind um, a lot is how do we as a community of healthcare workers uh, support each other during this time? Um, and you've spoken about the issue of burnout. And as those of us uh, who are not at their best um, um, may be able uh, to find solace and uh, renewal uh, in the support of their colleagues to be able uh, to, to contribute. Um, and I think it's a delicate balance uh, to achieve. Um, and, um, and something uh, I struggle with all the time. So I'll stop there and really um, wish to thank you again for a really wonderful lecture. Thanks, Rebecca. I agree with all your points and they are really major challenges. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. So there's a hand up from uh, Valerie Murizrai. Val Val? Thanks, thanks, Graham. Um, uh, Sally, it's always just such a treat to, to, to hear you and to, to be the beneficiary of your great wisdom. Um, one, of the, one of the abiding senses I've got from what you've talked about, there's a thread that runs through um, everything you've said, relates to the importance of collaboration and teamwork. And we sit here at a university that valorizes uh, individual achievement. Uh, and one of the issues that I really struggle with as a, as a, as a teacher, as a, as a person who, who really believes fundamentally in the power of collaboration, is that there are so many forces that mitigate against this. And I do think that we need a completely different way of thinking about working together and what individual achievement means in the context of, of, of team effort. And this has been brought into such sharp focus for me as a scientist seeing healthcare workers at the coalface working and really figuring out what can I do? I don't see patients, what can I do? And I think we have seen some good behaviors that have been modeled, but we've also seen some poor behaviors. But uh, I would love your thoughts on the question of how we can really socialize and develop a new generation of young people who think us as opposed to me. Thank you, Sully. Thanks, Val. That's you know, one of those questions, again, which would take almost an hour to answer and which calls for the opportunities uh, of all of us as health workers in many different capacities to get together, whether it's in Zoom or in real life, to discuss these issues, because I don't think that there are uh, simple answers that can be given. They are answers that must be found through the dialogue and through the interaction. 
Um, I've tried to deal with this recently in another context in Canada, where the barrier between communication with indigenous people and conventional Canadians is so wide that it's, it's almost like the Grand Canyon. And, and part of the problem relates to the way people see themselves, what they understand knowledge to be, what the ranking of their moral and other values are. And unless one can talk about those things and speak about them frankly with each other, it's not easy to create common ground. Uh, we, we, we live a competitive world where somebody's trying to knock somebody else's argument down. And I think we need to create the opportunities for much more collegial activities. And that's a big challenge. You know yourself from trying to find an AIDS vaccine that an enormous amount of money was pumped into collaborative work from people from many disciplines to seek the way of, of producing an AIDS vaccine. There's no research and no money and no resources being put into the social innovation that's required to help people to collaborate rather than compete. It's, it's a massive change in way of thinking that won't just happen overnight. It requires a dedicated effort. Thanks, thanks, Val, for the question. Um, so, Sully, there's, uh, there's one, um, one more question, and then I'm going to ask you to wrap up with, with the concluding slides. And the question that's in the chat box, um, I, I, it doesn't have the person's identity, there's just a number there, but the, the question is uh, with respect, it's really a question around public health ethics with confidentiality and patients' rights. Can one disclose a colleague's COVID positive status in the workplace in their absence and without their consent? Uh, the, the simple answer to that is no, because the much preferable route is to discuss with the colleague why it might be important to do that and to make sure that whatever one does will be will produce the least amount of harm. Uh, the, 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 the least restrictive principle means that just divulging something in a way that can do enormous harm to somebody is not appropriate. And um, the importance of this came to me when we formed a committee at the University of Cape Town to deal with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and being able to declare that someone was multi-drug resistant in their, in their community and in, in, if necessary to, to restrain them. And we had, a, we had a patient on the committee who'd had multi-drug resistant tuberculosis himself, and who'd been confined to Brooklyn Chest Hospital at the time. And hearing that person's views about what it meant to them helped the debate to develop. So I think the idea of just uh, uh, making it public without, without any attempt at trying to convince the person themselves of the value in doing that, and perhaps even in the value of they themselves uh, doing it, uh, would, be, would be not easily to, to, to support. So, Sully, I'm going to move on to the concluding slides and just put those up again. If you just give me a moment. There we go. Okay, so time is running out and I don't want to dwell on this. And I think that you can read these points for yourselves. Uh, but I mean, these are some of the issues that we need to do. We need to remind ourselves of our core values. Uh, it's very easy for those to escape from the forefront of our mind. And I do want to dwell at least on the first two, the understanding of the nature of suffering. Suffering is enormously personal. Uh, the way each one of us suffers is, is, is highly personalized. And in particular, when one's suffering at the end of one's life lonely in a hospital, as many of you have witnessed. And the importance of the communication skills, the importance of providing something to, to, to each other under those circumstances, that, that makes it easier uh, for, for people to have. I won't dwell longer on that list because I want to move on the last one to the last second last slide. Um, next one, thanks Graham. Yeah, the need to readjust public expectations. Uh, public expectations from life. I see around me, not only here, but in more affluent parts of the world, phenomenal sense of entitlements to what people are, 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 should have. I have the right to this, I have the right to that. Everybody seems to have rights without understanding the co-relative responsibilities that go with that. The concept of what we're entitled to has gone mad. Uh, in many ways, it, it goes from the idea of uh, people who were left out who said, well, me too, uh, that moved to me first, and now it seems to have moved to me only. There's so many me onlys around who have a sense of entitlement that is totally unconcerned with the entitlements of others. We need to be concerned 
about the expectations from medicine and healthcare to acknowledge the limits of what can be done. And we need to better come to terms with death. I think that um, there's been a big movement to help us to come to terms with death, but there's lots more that needs to be done for us to understand, to understand that. We need to think much more about population health and individual health, and we need to have a global and planetary perspective on health. These are the issues that have occupied my mind for the 22 years since I stood down from the headship of the Department of Medicine in 1999. I was very fortunate in being able to move into a multidisciplinary approach to public health and uh, global health ethics and into ideas of, of, of the future of the planet. And the next slide shows you um, two books that I was privileged to produce. The first one uh, was co-edited with Gillian Brock, a philosopher from New Zealand, entitled Global Health and Global Health Ethics, which examined many of the issues that have been raised regarding uh, global health in, in today's presentations. And fortunately, an, an, an a considerably updated and expanded version with many new topics in it has just been published. And that second edition has given me the opportunity to bring on board as co-authors and, 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 and colleagues, many people that I've worked in over the years. And they deal with a lot of the issues that we've raised during the course of today's presentation. But I would venture to suggest that it doesn't provide all the answers. It's a beginning. It's one of the few texts on this topic. It's been used as a teaching text quite widely. Um, I've been involved with teaching at the University of Toronto around this text, and it's, 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 it's the beginning. There's so much more that needs to be done. So my hope is that the global pandemic will help us to understand what global really means. The interconnectedness, our interdependence with nature, our inability to free ride on an environment that's desperately uh, challenged. And if we can, if, our, if the new generation of physicians can take some of these ideas on board, because it's, it's they who are going to have to deal with them, um, I won't be around uh, to deal with all of those issues. So there's a desperate need for the whole discourse on what health and, and ethics and global health means to move to another level. So with that, I'm going to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it won't be long before I can actually come into the lecture theatre with you and participate in some of your activities. Thanks very much, Sully. Um, just to, for me to conclude then and to say uh, a very big thank you to you. I think that was a really excellent session. Um, Broad ranging, um, many thought provoking strands. I think um, a, a timely reminder of, of some of the core values of our profession. Um, and reflecting on those uh, in the context of, of COVID-19 and, and the medical ethics issues and the public health ethics issues um, and, and giving us some, um, you know, conceptual frameworks um, fr from which we can approach and think about our day-to-day -day work. And I think that's so important. Often, you know, the work that we do is, is really in our face every day and just taking a step back um, and, and, and looking at, at the principles that underlie the work that we do, the ethical principles that, that uh, underpin what we do, and, and the kind of concepts that we grapple with day to day, what are the big picture issues, uh, is, is so valuable uh, to us and, and helps us reflect on the work that we do and, and you know, the work that we will do going forward. So, so once again, just to say thanks very much, Sully. We always value your, your thoughts uh, your inputs, your presentations enormously, uh, and it gives us, uh, you know, great guidance uh, for, for, for our work as a department uh, and our work as individuals. So thank you very much for your time and for all the effort that you put into preparing today. Thanks, Graham. And I must thank you because this is not me. It's a team effort. You raised all the questions and you challenged me to, to deal with those today. And the audience have participated superbly. So I see this as a joint contribution, and I hope that we've come closer together in understanding, A, all the tensions and pressures that everyone has been under, and my and many other people's uh, gratitude and praise for that, and I hope that this will help us to take the next step forward. So thank you all very much for, for coming today. Thanks. Good night.